Please join me in welcoming tonight's starting lineup, Commissioner Rob Manfred and number 43, President George W. Bush. Gentlemen. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you all for coming, Margaret. Thank you for the introduction. Laura, um, kind of reliving the old days, aren't we? Uh, I'm, for a baseball guy, I was going to say a baseball nut, but <laughs> for a baseball fan, it's a thrill for me to uh, share the stage with the commissioner. Uh, I'm, uh, I really believe the owners made a really wise choice in picking Rob uh, as the new commissioner of baseball. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, I do want to thank Alan Lowe and Amy Polly for uh, setting up this fantastic exhibition. It's, it's great, and I think the people who come are gonna be enthralled. Uh, Rob, I'm really glad that you brought Colleen with you, the thank first you. lady of baseball. Uh, I am, uh, wanna thank our sponsors like Margaret did as well. I do wanna give a shout out to some of the baseball people who are here. Uh, Laura and I had a, a glorious time uh, when we were in the game, and we made a lot of good friends, and I'm honored that so, so many came. Uh, a non-current owner, but someone who's got a huge name in baseball is Peter O'Malley of the L.A. Dodgers. And Peter, thank you very much for coming. Uh, uh, my longtime friend, mighty Chicago White Sox owner, Jerry Reinsdorf, who's uh, been very instrumental in the development of the game. And we're thrilled you're here, Jerry. Thank you for coming. Of the Atlanta Braves, the great Bill Bartholomew. Bill, thank you for coming. I appreciate you being here. Uh, from the St. Louis Cardinals, as much as I hate to bring them up after game six of the World Series, <laughs> uh, Bill and Kathy DeWitt and our relatives who are part owners of the Cardinals, the, uh, Craig and Debbie Stapleton are here. Welcome to, the, welcome to Dallas. And of course, the mighty Rangers are well represented. I think uh, the former president and ambassador to Japan and Australia, uh, Tom Schieffer, is with us somewhere. Oh, yeah. Bad seat, but I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you're a former, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, two of the current owners, Ray Davis, who's a senior owner and represents the Rangers at Major League Baseball levels with us, and, and his partner, Ken Hirsch. And so we're Thrilled you're here, Ray. This is the year. <laughs> Commissioner, we'll start with you. We'll start with this question. What is the state of baseball, the overall state? In other words, if you were to you know, summarize the strengths of the game, what would you say? I think the most important place to begin is the state of competitive balance in the game. At the end of the day, what we sell is competition. And over the last decade, we've had 27 of our 30 teams in the postseason. Um, we had the Kansas City Royals, one of our smallest markets, go all the way to game seven last year. And uh, Oakland was in for the third year in a row in the playoffs, and Pittsburgh the second year in a row. So I, I begin by thinking about competition. Um, our attendance has been amazing. Um, we draw 74, 73 and a half, 74 million fans every year. Um, our average attendance is over uh, 30,000 per game. Uh, so we've been very fortunate to have that strong live gate presence. And then like a lot of content owners, we have benefited um, from the media business, uh, put a lot of money into the game. So the game is really healthy, really Good. healthy. Uh, so y did you grow up as a baseball fan? Grew up as a baseball fan. Um, did you I grew have up in a upstate. favorite team? I'm sorry? Did you have a favorite team? I did. I grew up a Yankee fan. Um, we had cable television early <laughs> in upstate New York. <laughs> yeah, good, Rob. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Texas anyway. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me ask you this. Uh, I know you're an able administrator. What would you say are the goals? If you were sitting in front of the owners and listed the three most important goals during your tenure, what would, what would you tell them? Well, I think the first and most important goal is to pass our game on to a new generation of fans. It's a huge challenge for us. Um, young people have so many entertainment alternatives out there. I think that we need to work very hard um, to make sure that 
what has always been the generational aspect of baseball, fathers to sons, mothers to daughters, continues. Um, secondly, I think we have a challenge in terms of attracting the best athletes to the game. Uh, we need to be more diverse. Uh, we need to work very hard uh, to make sure that we continue to have the kind of athletes like Andrew McCutcheon, um, Clayton Kershaw that we have out, uh, out there today. Dallas boy. <laughs> I gotcha. <laughs> I gotcha. I'm doing better than the Yankees yes. right now. <laughs> so, and then the third thing, I, I, I think we have to um, adjust to what is a quickly changing media landscape. Um, the way that people consume content is changing very quickly, and I think we're well positioned to do that with MLB Advanced Media, but it is going to be a challenge for us going forward. Yeah. Uh, do you plan on lowering the MLB.com rates so a guy like me doesn't pay exorbitant sums? Do you know, if you drop me a little email, I bet you I can get you one of those ones with no blackouts I'm happy and a good price. I'm happy to contribute. Uh, you brought up an interesting point. I've never quite understood, um, uh, and I'm sure you've analyzed this, why um, we don't get more African Americans to play baseball. I think that... Um, it began with a problem of facilities in the inner city. Uh, it, you know, baseball is not the easiest game to play. Um, you do need a adequate facilities to attract people. And I think uh, the competition from both basketball and football is fierce. Uh, we get hurt because for both basketball and football, you have the opportunity to get a full scholarship to college. Uh, parents look at that and they see it as an opportunity. Uh, college baseball is a little different. They don't have the same kind of scholarships available. And I think we get hurt in that space. Yeah. And so um, what is the state of uh, youth baseball in uh, inner cities? Youth baseball in the inner cities is a challenge for us. Um, baseball has some great programs that have been in place for a num number of years. Our sort of broad-based program is called Revi Reviving Baseball in the Inner Cities. The, the purpose of that program is just to get participation. It's not about elite players. It's about getting kids to play the game. Um, we do that in partnership with the Boys and Girls Club. They're a great partner to us, you know, big presence uh, in, in a lot of inner city locations. Uh, interestingly, a big presence on 300 military bases uh, around the world. Um, so so the, they're a great partner uh, to us there. On the elite development side, uh, baseball's been involved at um, in partnership with the individual teams in developing urban youth academies. First one was in Compton. Um, I recently visited one in uh, Washington that really is an amazing facility. Uh, it, it, it is a bright spot in a very tough part of Washington. Three beautiful AstroTurf fields. Um, they actually have college teams from Georgetown. The facility is so good. They come there and they use the facility. And then the Georgetown athletes work with the kids when they come in in the afternoon. Um, enrichment programs in addition to baseball. So we're working hard um, at, at trying to restart uh, baseball in some of the areas where it's not been as popular. No, that's so um, the uh, instant replay. I mean, it's a game of tradition, right? It is a Instant game. replay is not very traditional. <laughs> uh, has it worked? Will it be expanded? I'm a fan of instant replay. Um, I think whenever we take on a project that affects the game on the field, we're trying to balance two things. The desire to modernize the game, be responsive to what we hear from fans on the one hand, and then, of course, on the other hand, not disrupting the history and traditions of the game. Uh, we always rely on people with lots of on-field experience. When we make changes like replay, it was a long process with a lot of testing before we jumped into it. But I thought last year, largely because of the great technology that was involved, that instant replay was a success. Um, it, it didn't really materially lengthen the games. Um, you know, about 45% of the calls that were challenged were overturned, which means that we corrected some calls that mattered. Um, and other than the catch-no-catch no catch problem that we had at the beginning of the year, we didn't have uh, a, a lot of difficulties with it. So uh, is uh, are the amount of time it takes to play a game, is that, in your mind, long, just right, too short? 
we got up over 302 last year and um, in, in terms of an average game time. Um, I, I think the three hour mark is kind of a problem for us. We, we, we do hear about it from our fans. Well, not if your team is winning. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, and, and you know, I think we hear less from fans that are actually in the ballpark. Um, I think it's more of a broadcast issue than it, than, than it is a ballpark issue. But we're working hard to try to clean up some of the uh, dead time in the game. We got a little sloppy on inning breaks. We got a clock on them this year for the first time to make sure you know we give our uh, business partners their 225, but not a lot more. And we are um, gonna have a batter's box rule in the big yeah. leagues for the first time, take out the glove adjustment that everybody claims or complains about. So it, 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 uh, is that being practiced now at spring training? Yes. Yep, we're using both the clock and the the inning clock and the uh, uh, batter's box rule in spring training. Uh, how are the Rangers going to do this year? <laughs> what I can tell you about that is this: I talked to Ray Davis before, and he seems to have great confidence. So, uh, <laughs> That's why we love him? Uh, let me ask you this question: uh, I'm often asked, should uh, Barry Bonds or somebody like Barry Bonds be in the Hall of Fame? You know, I think the players um, who've been involved with steroids, you have to divide them I I into different groups. Um, players who've tested positive or have otherwise been proved to use steroids, um, I, I think that um, getting them into the Hall of Fame is going to be a very, very difficult thing um, with the current set of writers that we have. What I, get con what I do get concerned about, and I'm comfortable with that. I mean, I understand why people have that reluctance. What I get concerned about is players where they never tested positive, they were never proved to have used in, in, in a legal proceeding of any type, but people looked at them and said, you know, he looked like a steroid user. You know, I spent a lot of time on steroids. There's no such thing as he looked like a steroid user. I mean, you just can't. You've been on steroids? <laughs> yeah. Do you I don't look, look like, like I a was steroid there? user? Yeah, right. no. <laughs> <laughs> see, I see what you're saying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, so you're, uh, if you, well, this is uh, an unfair question, but I'll ask it anyway. If you were a... If you were a writer, would you vote for some of these people that had outstanding numbers uh, to be in the Hall of Fame? Well, I mean, it depends on which of the two categories I've identified. You know, somebody who, who was proved to be a steroid user, I think I would have to discount the numbers based on that fact. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, Pete Rose. <laughs> he didn't use steroids, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure this issue will come to your desk. As a matter of fact, the reason I'm asking is, I think you're already public on the issue. I read, read right. something about That's it. That's correct. Uh, so what's the state of play there? Um, Pete Rose and his representatives um, filed um, a request for reinstatement, which was their right under the agreement that he negotiated with Commissioner Giamatti. Um, what I've said publicly about that is I'm going to um, be in touch with his representatives. We'll agree on a process for handling his request. Uh, I was not involved in the, the, the Rose matter when it originally um, happened, so I'm going to need to get up to speed on it. But we'll agree on a process that allows me to get familiar with all the facts, gives Pete an opportunity to be heard, and then I'll do what I think the Major League Constitution requires. I'll make a decision. Uh in terms of steroid use today, how, uh, how, how clean do you think the sport is? I think that there's been a, a massive cleanup of the game in, in terms of steroid use. Um, you, you know, I remember a decade ago, the World Anti-Doping Agency routinely criticized us for, you know, what the state of our programs were, and now, you know, they've said publicly over and over again that we're the best of the major professional sports. Um, it, it's interesting, I, this happened just the other day, I was talking to um, one of the lawyers that worked with Senator Mitchell on the um, report that was done about steroid use in baseball, and um, he, he actually worked with us um, on the Alex Rodriguez case, and he called me and he said, you know, I meant to talk to you after Alex's case was over, and he said, the most amazing thing is not how much better your programs are, and he says they are, They're, they really are improved, 
but he says your culture inside the game has changed so much since um, the time that the Mitchell investigation and report was done. Um, so I feel good about where the game is. Having said that, this is one of those issues you always have to be vigilant because the temptation, the economic motivation for young people to use drugs of this type is very, very strong. Yeah. And so the testing in minor leagues is pretty significant? Yeah, our minor league program, um, we've always used... you're constantly reading about some double-A guy, you know. Yeah. yeah he's what, got a 60 days. What happens is when you get... Um, younger players that enter the game, they don't realize how good the testing is. So we do have slightly <laughs> higher positive rates in the minor leagues. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you ought to warn them. <laughs> we do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, will Mexico City or Monterey, Mexico ever have a major league baseball team? I think you will see a time um, when there's a franchise in, in Mexico. Um, I, I think it presents a great opportunity for baseball, uh, I, not only in, in, in terms of the internationalization of the game, but sustained international activity that fits with the travel that's necessary in our game. I also think it presents a real opportunity for us domestically in terms of engaging the Hispanic market domestically. Um, so it's a twofer. Um, yeah. I don't think it's... Uh, next week issue, but I do see it happening. Uh, are there, if you were to expand to Mexico City, and I always used to hate to answer hypotheticals, and here I am asking them to you, but uh, would you shrink? I mean, is there, is there, are all franchises in, in, in shape today to be able to withstand, uh, you know, labor costs and uh, no. I, I think the, that in general we have very, very healthy franchises. I think that the two that um, most people mention when there's concern is Oakland and um, Tampa, and that's a facility issue, an issue that I know you grappled with when you owned the Rangers um, and successfully um, solved. But I, I, I do think ever since the building of the new stadiums, the wave of new stadiums that, that we have, if you don't have a state-of-the-art facility, it's very, very difficult for yeah. a major league franchise. And so what's the chances? Of I think that um, there's an opportunity uh, for Oakland to get something done in Oakland. Yeah. Uh, I, I do, you know, part of it is dependent on what shakes out with the other professional sports um, in, in that area. Tampa, I think that the owner, and it's always the owner who knows best, you know, they live in that local community, they, they understand what the politics are. I think Stu Sternberg in Tampa is optimistic about his chances of getting something done. In oh, good, good. Uh, do you uh, often talk to commissioners of other sports? Um, I do. Um, that's one thing that surprised me was how much uh, contact there was. Each of them reached out to me after the election, um, and I've had an opportunity to spend time with uh, commissioners Batman, uh, Silver, and, and, and Goodell. Um, and, you know, it was interesting, both Roger and um, Adam were very helpful in talking about the transition process because they went through transitions that were similar to, to, to mine in the sense that there was somebody long-time commissioner in place that they were. Yeah, speaking about that, how is Bud doing? He's great. Um, you know, he seems to be enjoying his retirement. Um, Colleen and I had dinner with uh, he and Sue last week in Arizona, um, and he, he seems to have adjusted to uh, uh, his new situation and seems quite happy. Well, have him give me a call if he wants to learn what it's like to be going 100 miles an hour to zero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is the state of play uh, in the uh, places like the Dominican Republic and uh, Puerto Rico in terms of uh, youth baseball and major league involvement with those, uh, with those countries? Well, it's interesting that you pick those two because I think they're opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, the Dominican uh, remains a uh, hotbed of development. Um, all of our major league clubs have academies there. Um, as a Every of, major league club yeah, does? Everybody does. And as a result of the, the situation in Venezuela, what's happened is not only are Dominican players being developed there, but their si players out of Venezuela are being signed and sent to the Dominican to develop. Um, it is free enterprise at its best and worst. Um, and because those young players are free agents and it's a very competitive environment. 
Um, in contrast, Puerto Rico is covered by the domestic draft. Um, the development efforts in Puerto Rico um, after uh, the draft was extended to cover Puerto Rico were not as strong. We've worked very hard to develop programs to replace um, the sort of natural competitive activity of the clubs, and we're starting to see some returns. Two years ago, the first player in the draft was from Puerto Rico, and we are seeing more players both playing college baseball and going in the draft. How close did you work with college baseball? College baseball, um, we have an ongoing dialogue with it. We see it as part of a, a broader focus on youth participation. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest determinant of fan avidity is whether you played as a kid. Um, it, it's true in baseball, it's really true in all sports. And so we're very focused on making sure that we get kids playing the game. And we see the NCAA as the top of that amateur pyramid, and, and we there are things that that need to change there. Um, the calendar, in terms of our draft, their college World Series, less than ideal, um, but we are having dialogue with them in, in an effort to make college baseball. Why don't you share with everybody the difference between scholarships in college for college baseball and scholarships for football? Yeah, I think that you know, I I like numbers; they always stick in my head. You know, in, in Football and basketball, virtually everyone at a Division I school who plays on a team is on a full scholarship. In contrast, a college baseball team cannot have more than 11.7 scholarships. I've never been able to get anybody to explain to me exactly where that point seven comes from and, and why, why it matters. But So what happens is um, if you have a three-sport athlete um, in high school, uh, he often has an opportunity to play college basketball or college football on a full ride, and almost nobody gets a full ride to play college baseball, and that's a real disadvantage for us yeah. in that competition. And so, uh, is there any headway being made with the NC2A on that? The, the NC2A is an organization that is in flux, and on a, uh, they're, they're, <laughs> they are, um, and well, sounds it sounds like you ought to run for president. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting used to this one, you yeah. know, <laughs> I got plenty to do. Um, um, I think that uh, there is flexibility in the NCAA as an organization is, you know, partially because of the pressure it's been under as a result of all the litigation and whatnot. And so I do think that they're looking to be better partners and they feel more flexibility about being partners with a professional sport. I know you've been very much involved with labor relations uh, throughout your tenure at Major League Baseball. How, long, how many years have, have you been at Major League Baseball? I came inside in 1998. Yeah. So 16 years I've been inside, and then I started as an outside lawyer in 1987. That's right, yeah. And so what's the state of play uh, between baseball and, and Major League Baseball and, and, and the Players Union? Well, we, we've worked really hard on the relationship with the MLBPA in the period of time since the, the long strike in 94. Um, I think that um, Michael Wiener, who was the head of the Players Association for much of that period, uh, was a really positive force, really talented, creative, um, someone who was looking to make a deal, looking to grow the game. And, and you know, we've had three agreements in a row, 21 years with, with no disruption. Um, now, unfortunately, you know, we lost Michael a little over a year ago. We have new leadership at the MLBPA. But one of the things we try to do is have a deep relationship there. So it wasn't just, you know, Rob Manfred and Mike Wiener. It was a variety of people at different levels have relationships. And um, we're optimistic that when we do our next contract, which will be after the 2016 season, that we'll be able to continue that positive run. Good. So uh, earlier you were describing to me something called streaming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. so, so I'm sure everybody knows what it means here. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, just in case they don't. Right. What, what, why don't you describe what that means and why that's an asset for Major League Baseball? Well, when, when people use the phrase streaming, what they're talking about is delivery of broadcasts over the internet as opposed to through a cable system or, or a traditional broadcast medium. Um, so like MLB.TV, if you buy an outer market package from, from us and it, it, that MLB.TV product is a streamed product. 
Um, it, it's important in baseball, not only because it's an important way for our fans to engage in the game, it's also important because MLB.com has become a leader in the technology of streaming. So not only do they stream a lot of baseball games, but the new HBO Now product will be, the technology will be provided by MLB.com. Um, WWE, the wrestling uh, activity, um, that's another product that is streamed and available to consumers. Yeah, Laura loves that yeah, I bet she does. <laughs> <laughs> I bet she does. But we also do a lot of streaming, for example, for the... <laughs> wrestling. We also do the Masters and a bunch of streaming for ESPN. Um, no. So how does the new FCC ruling affect you, do you know? Well, yes, um, we, we were in favor of net neutrality a, a, as an industry because like most technology companies, um, we believe that a free and open internet is good for the development of new products. Particularly if you're the best streamer. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, we've got mics around if anybody would like to ask the commissioner any questions. Uh, Debbie, my cousin. Hold on, here comes a mic, Debbie. There is a young African-American girl that got a lot of publicity recently for her pitching. Right. Um, is it inconceivable that a, a woman uh, would ever be able to break through into baseball in the, at the national level? Let me tell you a little story about the um, young woman you're talking about. Her name is Monet Davis. Um, I, I actually went to Williamsport shortly after the election and um, had an opportunity to meet Monet, and I had to throw out a first pitch. And then she threw the first pitch in the game right afterwards. And given the comparison of those two things, I, I have to say, I think it is possible that there would be a woman that, that, that could, you know, be good enough to participate at the major league level. Um, this young woman is amazingly athletic. Um, she looked right at me when I met her and uh, I said, you know, it's just unbelievable what you've accomplished here this summer. And she looked at me and she said, you know, I like baseball all right, but I'm going to play basketball for UConn. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> uh, so so uh, are there women umpires? In the minor leagues? We have some women umpires in the minor leagues. Um, you know, minor league umpiring is a very difficult job. It's, it's actually harder to get to the big leagues as an umpire than it is to get there player. as a player. You know, our umpires tend to work a very long time once they get there. And um, it, it is an issue. Um, the, the length of time that it takes is an issue in terms of promoting diversity, both gender and race. Yeah. And relations with the umpires? Um, we just did a new agreement with the umpires. Um, I, I have to say, and I, I was remiss when you asked me about replay because I didn't mention it. I think in addition to the technology, one of the reasons that replay worked as well as it did last year is we got tremendous cooperation from the umpires. You know, traditionally, they were opposed to replay as a, you know, it undermined their authority, yeah. whatever. And, you know, I think um, their philosophy changed It'd be largely because they got tired of watching their mistakes on ESPN. I, I, and I mean that. I am serious about that. So they were very cooperative in terms of um, yeah. making that change. I had to watch my mistakes on NBC. But <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Bow tie. <laughs> By the way, they're coming back. <laughs> How do you see the changes with U.S. Cuban relations affecting recruiting there with players like Juan Moncada? Uh -huh. Yes, the, the um, policy change um, that President Obama announced has had an impact um, on our business. Uh, the impact has been quick on the player side because even without a lot of formal change in the regulations, the flow of players out of Cuba has become uh, uh, much more open. Um, it's a great source of talent. Our clubs are really interested in it. Um, where it hasn't really had an effect yet is on the business side because there hasn't been the regulatory change 
necessary to really allow us to do much from a business perspective. So a Cuban player can come now, come now can come directly from Cuba as opposed to going to like Mexico or somewhere? They, they, that has um, to do more with our rules than it does with the federal government's rules. You could always come um, directly to the United States. Um, the problem is if a Cuban comes directly to the United States, he becomes subject to the draft. The reason they go to the intervening country is to avoid being subject to the draft. Yeah, got it. So why don't you extend the draft? What's the reasoning for not extending the draft to Cuba or uh, Dominican Republic? Or I'm a believer like that we should have um, a draft system that covers the entire world. Um, I, just in terms of equity, it makes sense to me that there should be a single method of entry into professional baseball. Uh, the union has been resistant. Uh, Why? I, you know, it's interesting. I think mostly because of vested interests, largely in the Dominican Republic. You know, there's a lot of people who have a lot of money invested in providing players to Major League Baseball, and the ability to recover that investment would be diminished if there were worldwide draft. And how is the draft working? The domestic draft, we made a lot of changes in in the last round of bargaining. Um, I think it, it, it was those changes were successful in restoring the draft to, to its original purpose. That is, the weakest team is able to get the best talent at, at, at an affordable price. This whole, you know, uh, George Bush is so good that he slips down to the Yankees because they're the only ones that. No, there's no chance of that. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was just an example. Yeah. <laughs> might have used another name. But anyway, <laughs> George Bush had trouble making the Yale freshman team. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, here comes your mic. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. It makes me crazy that the uh, outcome of the All-Star game dictates home field advantage in the World Series. You have an amateur game that is uh, playing an important role of the World Series. Is there any thought about removing that finally, hopefully? And let me, a second question while I have you, <laughs> while I have you. Any notion of implementing the designated hitter in the National League? Okay, um, l let me start with the All-Star game. First of all, the last time I checked, the people that played in the All-Star game were, in fact, professionals, okay? It was not an amateur game. Um, the the whole old home field advantage rule was it rotated year by year. There's not a, lash, a lot of rationale or science behind that. Um, the new rule actually does something that benefits the fans. It has made the game more competitive. The players care about it more because there's something on the line, and it has kept the All-Star game as the best All-Star game in, in, in professional sports. So um, while I understand that as an intellectual matter, there may be purer ways to decide home field advantage, I think it, it does something for the fans that's really important, the rule the way it is. Um, the DH, I I'll tell you, it's interesting. I get asked about this all the time. Of all the things I've worried about, I never have worried about the fact that there was no DH in the National League and a DH in the American League. I think it's one of those issues that makes baseball great. People like to debate which way it should be. And most importantly, I got a pretty good group of National League owners. I don't think they have a lot of interest in having a designated hitter. So, um, a couple of them are here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think there's one in right here. Yeah, very smart Rome. answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How'd I do, Bill? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, Stevenson. Giants fan, by the way. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you touched a little bit on uh, globalizing the sport a little bit in Dominican Republic and Venezuela and now Cuba. Uh, but in terms of uh, globalizing it as a fan base, mm -hmm. especially now that Derek Jeter is no longer in the sport, you have the face of baseball. With other sports, like you go to China, Kobe Bryant, he is the most popular player there, aside from Yao Ming. Uh, so what is Major League D Baseball doing to help globalize the fan base? Well, 
We have a number, the, the issue you raise with respect to Derek Jeter is actually a broader issue. You know, we have a generational issue, um, you know, the Derek Jeters, the Mariana Rivera's, they all kind of have gone from the game. And we're working really hard um, at raising people's awareness of the great young players that we have in the game. And they're not just great players, they're great people. Um, the Andrew McCutcheons, the Clayton Kershaws, they're really appealing people. Um, and you will see a marketing effort in, in, in this, this coming season that's really focused on those players, um, trying to make them bigger stars, not only here, but outside the US. Secondly, we try to take the game to people outside the United States. Last year, um, we opened the season in Australia. Um, it really was an amazing trip. The, the, the Sydney Cricket Ground actually was transformed into a really nice ballpark. Um, people love the games. Um, the first game we played there was a nine nothing uh, route and everybody stayed the whole time. They had the biggest concession gate they've ever had in the facility. So a second piece of it is taking the game live to places where it's not been traditionally played. We follow that with investments in those countries. So for example, in Australia, most people don't know this, but we own a six-team professional league and we actually get major league quality players out of that league. So those are the sorts of initiatives that we use to try to internationalize the game. Do the clubs like to uh, kick the season off in Australia? You know, that varies clubs to club a long to club. Way to go. It, it is a long way to go. It, the trade-off is this. It's a great trip. The players love, you know, love the trip. Um, their families love the trip. The difficulty is um, not only is it a long trip, but you start the, because of the logistics, right? You go, you play two real games, you come back, you play a few spring training games, get over your jet lag, and then start again. And it's an unnatural break, you know, from when you had the club. Baseball players think about it as an everyday continuous activity, and I think that's start and stop is a challenge for us with respect to openers. How are you dealing with, is Major League Baseball uh, dealing with uh, uh, players being broke after their time in Major League Baseball? And if so, what are you doing about it? One, one of the uh, advantages that uh, we have as a result of the fact that we pay our players very well and we guarantee them a lot of money is we have less problems on that front than some other sports. But for years, um, baseball has had a captive in-house charity, the baseball assistance team, um, that provides assistance not only to players, but all members of the baseball family. And in addition, that model has become so popular in the game that there's actually um, a second group that focus only on scouts. Um, Jerry's been very involved in, in that group for years. And so, you know, we're really proud of our in-house charities that try to take care of the baseball family. Uh, yes, ma'am. So I was in college during the Boston Marathon bombing. And that year, the Red Sox won the World Series. Um, and it was an immense sense of healing for the community. And no one can forget um, when President Bush threw that pitch in Yankee Stadium. So I was wondering in light of tonight's topic, America's presidents and America's pastime, if you could comment on what you view the relationship between baseball and America is. Well, let me start with the, the narrow, um, a narrow observation. I was actually lucky enough to, to, to be there um, the night that President Bush um, threw out the first pitch at Yankee Stadium after 9-11. And um, I think it's probably one of the absolute most memorable um, things that I've had an opportunity to see in my life. As a matter of fact, I was telling President Bush earlier that um, I've never been an autograph person because, you know, I work with players. You don't want, you know, wh why would you want to do that? Um, so the only autograph baseball I've ever kept of all the ones that I've had and given away have passed through the Manfred House is one that President Bush signed that night. And um, I've always kept it because it was such a meaningful memento for me. Um, I, I think that 
the relationship of baseball generally to our culture is a special one. Um, you know, people feel about our game differently than, than they feel about other sports that they like. It is more a part of their lives because we're out there every day, um, all season long, and, and it does become ingrained in everything you do if, you, if you're, you're a fan. And when the country has the kind of crises that, that you referred to, the Boston Marathon situation, or, or obviously 9-11, um, I think one of the greatest things about baseball is you have a, it, it provides an opportunity um, to play a role in the healing of the country. And um, that's just, it's a great feeling to be a part of that. It's also a game you don't have to be a giant to play it. It is true. <laughs> Normal sized people play it, yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm a Cardinals season ticket holder. Well, here's and DeWitt right here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so many of our playoff games were on subscription cable networks last year. How do you want to ensure that you're able to expand Major League Baseball to the masses when many of them can't afford to watch their teams play on these networks? The, there, there is a tension, okay, between the um, economics of sport um, that's driven by now largely cable delivery um, and the desire to have the games um, as broadly available as possible. Um, our World Series is and always has been on broadcast television. Um, I can't imagine a, a, a situation uh, where that is not the case. And the networks that carry the earlier rounds um, are generally basic tier networks. They're not premium channels. So we are very cognizant uh, uh, about trying to uh, make sure that those playoff games are uh, available as broadly as possible. I think the difficulty for us is that um, we have so much postseason product in the month of October. Broadcast television won't take all that product. There's just too much of it. So it, it is something that we're very cognizant of and we try to strike the right balance to make as much of it available on free TV as we possibly can. Along those lines, as you analyze the pricing of the average family for go to a baseball game, how does baseball compare to uh, other sports uh, or movies or other forms of entertainment? Baseball is a great bargain still. We are literally, our average ticket price, I was looking at the numbers on the plane on the way down here, we are still half of the next highest professional sport. Um, so we, we've always been the least expensive and the least expensive by 50% still. Um, even in terms of a movie, um, you know, in a lot of our ballparks, there are real, even in big cities, you know, people talk about pricing in New York, you know, there are $5 tickets for sale in Yankee Stadium. Um, and $20 hot dog. <laughs> You're tough. <laughs> you are tough. <laughs> Eat before you go to the game, right? That's right. <laughs> we got time for a couple of more. And speak about hot dogs, you're not going to have a hot dog for dinner, but uh, something like, kind of like that. Yes. Yeah, it seems like uh, injuries are playing a bigger role in affecting the product that's on the field, especially here in Texas. Uh, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about programs, development, uh, limitations to help, uh, help deal with that. Yeah, we, we put together, um, because of the rash of Tommy John injuries that we've had in the last couple of years, particularly among younger pitchers, uh, we put together a group of the leading orthopedists in the game, leading orthopedists in the country, in, in fact, to look specifically at this issue. Um, interestingly, one of the first things that they asked us to do was to get um, some standards in place in youth baseball. Um, one of the big changes that's happened in youth baseball, you know, when I was a kid, you played baseball in the spring, you played basketball in the winter, you played, you know, football in the fall. Now, a lot of young people that are interested in baseball, they're playing 10, 12 months a year, they're throwing a lot more, they don't have those natural breaks. So along with USA Baseball, um, we put together a program called Pitch Smart that's designed to help coaches understand what the appropriate uses of pitchers at various ages and stages of the de development are. 
Um, at the big league level, we have an ongoing study involving all the pitchers in six organizations. Um, we're doing physicals, uh, biomechanical studies, collecting a tremendous amount of data on all the pitchers to see if we can identify whether there's things in pitcher mechanics or anatomies that make them predisposed to these Tommy John type injuries. Now, obviously, that's a little longer term effort. Uh, I, I promised Manford he wouldn't have to sit up here for more than 45 minutes. And we've been up here for 46 minutes. <laughs> I, I, I hope you can see why the owners made a wise choice in selecting Rob as the commissioner. Thank you.